510, but I sent her an email. But I think she's called in now. Do we have you on the line, President Mack? Yes, sir, I am. I'm here. All right. Thank you for uh, accepting our invitation to come on um, our global black radio station uh, on this particular program to discuss the NAACP uh, Charlotte chapter. So I guess, you know, congratulations on your new position is in order. Thank you. And I appreciate you having me. Oh, you're most welcome. Um, As I had communicated to you, um, I knew the former president uh Ko- kojo nantambu i used to go to church with him my family knows his family um he led the naacp for about six years and i was unaware that you know he was having health problems which is why he stepped down and but how long have you been there i know you were like a communications director was your previous position and so uh um were, was this unexpected to you and and so what was your background with the uh charlotte chapter I was the community affairs chair for the last five years. Um, I was responsible for organizing all of our events and um, outreach to the community uh, and working hand-in-hand hand, hand hand with Reverend Culture, who I adore. So um, was it unexpected, uh, his stepping down? Was that unexpected, or was that something that y'all knew internally was coming down the road? Well, I knew. Um, he had confided in me probably about seven or eight months prior, um, but told me to keep it in confidence, and I did. Um, I did not intend to run. <laughs> I actually decided to run 30 days prior to the election. Okay, okay. Now, again, congratulations on winning the election. And I, when I initially contacted you, you know, it was about an article that I saw uh, written up on a local news site. Um, but to be honest with you, I don't even want to go down that road because I don't think it's important, you know, to uh, to rehash that. I understand there has been some uh, miscommunication about your plans or your vision for the future uh, direction of the Charlotte chapter of the NAACP. So I just want to get into that. Uh, what do you envision as the, you know, most pressing issues that the NAACP in Charlotte is looking at in terms of, you know, uh, uh, fighting on behalf of oppressed people? Well, uh, we will litany a position because we have um, so many problems in the African American community that have not been addressed. Um, but one of the major issues for me here in Charlotte is economic and the lack thereof. Uh, African American men who are um, who are formerly incarcerated have the greater barriers to getting employment. As you know, uh, the unemployment records nationally have gone down, but in Charlotte, in particular areas uh, where black people uh, are concentrated, you find higher numbers. Keeping in mind that the unemployment rolls will purge you off of their roll right. once you are unemployed more than 18 months. And clearly, after some frustration and even um, some demoralization, you stop even looking for work. So it's not a, it's not a clear picture of what the unemployment, you know, looks like here in Charlotte, especially in my community. Right. You know, we keep hearing the White House and, and other politicians and the uh, corporate news media citing, oh, the jobs, you know, uh, outlook is, is is great. Uh We have added all of these hundreds of thousands of jobs and the unemployment roll numbers are are dwindling. And that's just not being truthful. Um, as you just stated that after 18 months, you're removed from the roles, whether you find found a job or not. And and so, I mean, why do you think they engage in such um, um, in such language that's not giving you the truth of the matter of the situation? Why do you think that is? I think it's just been a practice. You know, everybody has a policy. They have procedures that they set up and rules. And um, unfortunately, no one's ever questioned it. Mm-hmm. And there's never been any pushback around it. And when you look at the um, economy now, when you have the wealthy and the wealthier versus the middle class, which is you know dwindling very quickly, mm-hmm. and the working poor, there is such a disparity. And so, who should be the the voices that say to not only the White House but say to the state assembly and our senators and congress- congressional 
people, listen, there needs to be a different way that we look at those numbers. There has to be a way that we track people who have been work, looking for work for two years, for three years, for four years, who haven't found employment. For those young brothers that come out of these prisons that make millions for someone else that doesn't look like us, mm-hmm. um, who begin to say, let me try to do something different because I don't want to go back. And once again, get into the cycle of despair because they cannot find work. And I'm not talking about work that pays you $7.40 an hour, right. okay? That doesn't sustain your family. I'm talking about work that will sustain you, that we get a pay that will sustain our families, that people can say, you know, I am proud of the work that I'm doing. I'm able to feed myself and pay my car note, pay my mortgage or my rent, and pay my gas and electric bill and not be stressed out the very next day because I have no more money. Those are kind of jobs that I'm looking for us to begin to build here. If we can give money to Chiquita Banana and to the baseball stadium and to NASCAR, well, we need to find money to create jobs. I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm glad you brought that up. Now, the Obama administration has been said to have been pushing for a jobs bill, which has, you know, the Republican Party, the GOP, uh, just seems to try to railroad it and, and keep that from coming forth. But they're locally. Let's talk locally there with the uh, Charlotte City Council and, and the, and the uh, mayor. And let's talk about the North Carolina state, you know, legislature. Um, have you seen any kind of jobs bills on a local level or on a state level? Are you kidding me? No. In fact, last year, I spent an entire year um, going to city council and county commissioners Tell them about a job um, creation idea that we had that was good jobs because when I was in New York as a union vice president in New York, we were able to create a job a program. But, of course, in New York is very different because it's a union state. Mm-hmm. We had collective bargain that so was able to negotiate contracts across the table from the New York City Transit Authority to take people off the welfare roll and get them gainfully employed. Mm-hmm. So I tried to do it here, but I was told many days, many times over and over again, that's not what we do. So my question to city council is what exactly do you do? Can you just, you know, give us a brief synopsis of that particular uh, uh, jobs program that you were pitching? Sure. It was a um, job subsidy program. And the way it would work is that small businessmen would have the ability to get the money funded directly to them um, as, a, as a subsidy. They would then in turn hire these people which was four categories. Those who were formerly incarcerated, those who were cool, chronically unemployed, those who were single parents, probably single mothers with children, and also, excuse me, those who, um, the last one, mm-hmm. unemployment, women, based on, on long-term unemployed, and, on, and there was a lottery system for those who had been less than um, 18 months of unemployed but still wanted to go into that program. And so the subsidy would go directly to the small business person. They would hire people because they needed people but could not afford to hire someone. Mm -hmm. And through that process, we would have a holistic training, a holistic holistic mentoring, especially those who were formerly incarcerated, to really begin to get their minds focused on what it it would take to stay um, employed. Mm -hmm. That would happen for six months. We're talking about a 100% subsidy going to a small business person. For six months. For me, for six months. And that would give the, the small business person enough opportunity to build their business so now they could keep that person on themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My thing is that if you do that, the small business person who's more, most likely somebody of color now has an opportunity to build their, their job or their business, give someone else a job. That person now in turn is paying taxes. Mm-hmm. The small business person is paying taxes. Now you have a greater consumer levels happening in the city and specific areas and it's a win-win for the city and the city's response was we don't do that that's not our job Mm -hmm. but like you mentioned apparently it's their jobs to subsidize private businesses like um the uh charlotte panthers um building that stadium and upgrades um also, I'm not sure if Time Warner Cable had gotten any government 
uh, subsidies. But I, I believe, yeah, when Bob Johnson was running the Bobcats, that he did get some some of the taxpayer money as well and, and special privileges and, and whatnot to build up that franchise. And then, again, you mentioned uh, NASCAR, which the NASCAR Hall of Fame is in Charlotte as well in the university area. Hmm. Correct. Hmm. Um. I'm glad that you brought up and I'm glad that you are focusing on helping uh, those who have been formerly incarcerated. Um, I'm just going to keep it real with you, President Korean, because we use language to describe it as 21st century slavery and human trafficking uh, per the 13th Amendment, which says that slavery and um, human, excuse me, slavery and involuntary servitude shall be abolished except as punishment for a crime where a person has been duly convicted. I'm sure I don't have to tell you. My brother, my brother don't apologize. Mm-hmm. It's the reality. It's real. And the bottom line is, when you look at the makeup of the, of the um, institution, it is institutionalized racism. That's exactly what it is. Mm-hmm. Don't apologize. That's what it is. Right. And, and Big business making money off the backs of African Americans once again. Right. And and this has touched me in a personal way because I consider myself a new abolitionist, um, carrying on the work of past abolitionists fighting against slavery in this country. And we do a radio program, a weekly radio program called New Abolitionist Radio, just to educate and agitate, you know, for in. But it turns touched me personally when, you know, one of my baby brothers was was uh wrongfully convicted for a crime that he didn't commit, all white jury. Uh, no evidence, but the homeowner's word against he is that uh, my brother had broken his house and stole some stuff. And I was off in the military serving this country, as they say, you know, while this was being happening to my brother. So I talked to my brother after he got out. He spent 10 years in, in a North Carolina prison sentence, and he told me how he was made to go work on turkey farms and processing turkeys and working for private businesses uh, for basically slave wages. See, a lot of th- mm-hmm. a lot of people say, well, if they're getting paid wages, then that doesn't mean that, you know, they are being enslaved or they're being treated as slaves. Well, I would point them to history to where you had uh, enslaved African people who were particularly skilled in, in areas like blacksmithing where to appease them, uh, their enslavers would pay them a small, you know, a portion, a portion of the profits. Mm-hmm. So, so it has touched me in a personal way. And I'm glad to hear that that is, you know, one of the main things that the, um, North Carolina, uh, Charlotte chapter of the NAACP is looking at. Now, are you aware of the Redeem Act? The uh, congressional legislation that was introduced last year by Senator Rand Paul and co-sponsored by Senator uh, Cory Booker. So this is bipartisan legislation. Have you had an opportunity to review that? I reviewed. I reviewed it, but not at length. Now you just um, looked at something briefly, and then you get into a conversation, and then you turn on the television to listen. Well, I listen to Ed show every day. So, um, and then you hear the conversation and. And pretty much jot things down. But here, here's the thing. And I mean, in disrespect to anyone, because something is called bipartisan doesn't make it bipartisan. Okay? In my mind's eye, our system is broken. The political system is broken. Mm-hmm. Because what happens is lobbyists have more power than anyone else. The people don't have anything anymore. The person who comes and sits at the table and says, I can give you this for this, is a person who gets to work them. So, um, though I have very, you know, a lot of respect for Cory Booker, my concern is that anything that then the falls involved with is really beneficial. Mm-hmm. And we all know that there's some language written over the course of the last 15, 20, 30 years that sounds like it's good for us, but we know that it's not good for us. Well, I, right? uh, President Korean, I have my and uh, some of my fellow abolitionists, we have studied this particular legislation. And it is not very complicated as we, you know, sometimes see bills that are like hundreds of pages long. And, of course, when it's that long, they're hiding stuff in it. But this bill is pretty much straightforward. And if you allow me to, I will quickly read you the bill summary. And okay. um, and then that way, you know, off of, off of this, you can make a, a better informed uh, assessment of it. Um, but okay. I, you know, um, I wholeheartedly, uh, think, does it solve the problem? 
of mass incarceration, re-enslavement of, of black people and non-white people in this country? No, it doesn't. But it does uh, address many of the issues that, that you just talked about in terms of, you know, the, uh, um, our brothers and sisters coming off of the prison plantation being unemployable because they have these records. So let me just quickly read this bill summary. It's not very long. Okay. All right. Okay. It was uh, introduced in the Senate on uh, July 8, 2014. It says mm-hmm. record expungement designed to enhance employment act of 2014 or the redeem act amends the federal criminal code to provide a process for the sealing or expungement of records related to nonviolent or juvenile offenses requires a court considering a petition to seal a nonviolent offense to balance factors, including the harm of the protected information to the ability of the petitioner to secure and maintain employment. Sets Mm -hmm. forth limitations on involuntary room confinements at juvenile detention facilities. They're, they're talking about solitary Mm -hmm. confinement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, amends the personal responsibility and work opportunity reconciliation act of 1996 to remove offenses relating to possession or use of a controlled substance from the categories of drug offenses that result in the convicted individual being ineligible for assistance under one, a state program funded with temporary assistance for needy families grants under part a of title uh, four of the social security act and right. to the supplemental nutritional a nutrition assistance program, which is called SNAP, formerly the food stamp program, or mm-hmm. any state program carried out under the F- Food and Nutrition Act of 2008. Now, it prohibits the denial of such assistance and benefits if the convicted individual committed an offense related to substance abuse disorder, participates in a substance abuse treatment program, and three, complies with all court-imposed obligations, includes employment services among the categories of federal benefits that are not to be denied under a PRWORA. And the last sentence, it says, it amends the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Acts of 1968 to allow the Attorney General in awarding public safety and community policing grants to give preferential consideration to an applicant in a state with laws similar to this act. Your thoughts? Okay, Okay, so my thoughts, well, first I have to apologize to Mr. Mr. Ron Paul finally did something good. That's my first thought. (laughs) I have to apologize. Um, So let me say this. That the, just based on what you said in terms of the summary, that can do um, a world of good for many of them, and I can think of the, off the top of my head. First and foremost, as you probably know right now, if you um, are incarcerated and you have a felony, you are now um, exempt from any kind of federal help. Mm-hmm. You're exempt from um, from pretty much everything, including the right to vote. So uh, at least based on what you said in the summary, that will give them some semblance of assistance, as I would call them aftercare, because I've been doing prison ministry for over 30 years. Aftercare. So there, there has to be an aftercare mm-hmm. once the person is released from, from, from the prison system. And that aftercare would entail assisting them with um, money, housing, um, health care, that would help them in their transition back into the workplace. Cause we're talking about lifetime banishment, lifetime prohibition from these federal programs. And, and I would point out that even when they do find employment, whether it is just a little seven dollar job that they can't sustain themselves off, they're still paying taxes. So that's like taxation without representation. Right. Which is what I'm saying, that right now they they have no right to pretty much anything. Um, and you, and, and we're being told that the reason they're being in, incarcerated is for corrective measures, correct? That's, that's what, what they, they say, say. But that's not what it is. That's not what it is. It really is banishment. It's, it's being exiled. Mm-hmm. And if, and one of my one of my uh, my favorite people is Paul Robeson because he spoke he spoke truth to life, and he was exiled for speaking the truth. And so when I look at what's happening to black men every single day incarcerated, some as your friend or your brother uh, was, 
wrongfully incarcerated, uh, 10 years out of your life. Can you imagine 10 years out of someone's life and what that does to a man? Mm-hmm. And see, folk understand the other folk. They understand that if you kill the black man, you kill the black family. I am a true believer that the black man is the creature of our household. And so when you destroy him, you destroy the family. Yes, black women, because I'm a black sister who had to provide for my children when my husband and I got divorced. I did the best I could, but I cannot teach my black son how to be a black man. Only a black man can do that. And I prefer that the black father would do that. And so there's been a systematic destruction of the very fiber of who we are as black people. Mm-hmm. That's what's happened. So for me, anything that's going to bring us back together again as a family and as a village, I'm for it. Right, right. Again, you know, like the way I try to talk to my listening audience or anybody that I'm having conversations about is, is that because I'm already seeing, unfortunately, some non-white people, when we talk to them about this legislation, as soon as they hear Rand Paul's name, they think Tea Party. Okay. And they just automatically dismiss this bill without even reading it. And I'm like, do you know how many non-white people, pr- primarily black people, are being ne- uh, negatively impacted by not being able to get food assistance, by not being mm-hmm. able to qualify for public housing, by not, by being discriminated against? This is like it, to legally discriminate someone. This is to put them in a permanent state of Jim Crow, uh, so That's to right. speak. And and, and right. so, you know, I just think that this bill on the face of the summary and, and looking at it, again it's not a very complicated bill that why it does not solve the problem of mass incarceration re-enslavement it does help to prevent people from going right back in because i feel i feel like uh president mac is that this is a mouse trap that when you ban people and prevent them from getting their feet back under them and to be able to provide for themselves, you get the basic necessities that you're really just pushing them back into a life of crime so that they'll end right back on the prison plantation. I believe it's designed that way, President Mac. It is. Well, I mean, that's why the recidivism is so high. That's why it is so high, because, as I said before, when a person is in a spirit of despair, they say, well, let me go back to what I know. I don't believe that our young men want to continue to go back and in, in forth and jail like some yo-yo. I believe they really truly want to have a decent paying job where they can be proud of what they're doing. Their families can be proud of what they're doing. And they don't have to be concerned about being away from their family. But I mean, the way the system is set up, it is set up for our black men to fail. Now, don't get me wrong. Every individual has responsibility for their action, yes, but not to the detriment of their life. A lifetime not punishment. Destroy their life, because that's what it is. It's a lifetime destruction. Mm-hmm. You're telling you're telling the person who does ten years in, in in jail, who has done their time, that when you come out, we still don't care. You're nobody. You're nothing. You're invisible to us. That's exactly what you're telling them when you say that we're not going to help you. We're not going to give you nothing. Do it for yourself. So, have you found on this particular issue of of helping, you know, the formerly incarcerated? Uh, legally discriminated against. Have you found any kind of support in either, you know, the uh, Charlotte City Council or state legislatures who are talking about addressing this issue? Have you seen anything? No, not as yet. Not as of yet. We, I have had some assistance with the racial profiling bill that we put in. Okay. We started with an ordinance with the Citizen Review Board here, um, and that was around the murders of our African American men at the hand of police. Um, and, of course, that conversation has to be expanded. We have to remember that um, each state, and in particular, each city, does things differently. And my coming from New York when I first got here, you know, I know people call me assertive and aggressive. They probably call me the B word, too, behind my back. But because I'm used to things working very differently, I had to, I had to readjust <laughs> how I do things here. And um, sometimes I still get a little bit, you know, off the cuff. You know, I want to tell people off. But my thing is it's never about me. It's about the people I'm trying to serve. So I'm systematically, day by day, trying to find another person who is like-minded to come on board. So we're trying to form a coalition of people, which is a very diverse group of people coming together for this very issue. How do we assist those who need the most help? 
and one of the greatest barriers for those who are formerly incarcerated. They have the biggest barrier. So that's what we're working on. Now, um, I want to take a short station identification break, but when we come back, President Matt, I want to talk about the issue of, of police brutality as, as we're seeing um, a lot of people, uh, primarily young people, but they're being supported by people of all ages. But we're seeing mass demonstrations occur across this country in the wake of the uh, Ferguson, what happened in Ferguson with uh, Michael Brown being gunned down uh, mm-hmm. by Darren Wilson. And, you know, we've had uh, some police shootings uh, there in Charlotte um, with mm-hmm. Jonathan Farrell being shot and killed by uh, um, uh, Randall Carrick. And right. um, I have to say, I was kind of pleased with how quickly he was charged with a crime. Uh, but now we have a 74 a, a year old veteran. And I know this is in Gastonia and, and mm-hmm. not in your county and not in Charlotte. But if you have any thoughts, I would like you to share about the uh, killing of of the uh, veteran 74 year old James Allen in his own home um, mm-hmm. as the police were trying to do a wellness check. So we're going to take a station identification break. I do want to let the listeners know if you have a question. Uh, for our guests, again, we, we are joined by President Corinne Mack from the Charlotte chapter of the NAACP. Please don't wait to the last minute because I have to get off air on time as tonight is the debut of the uh, program coming on in the time slot after me. That's the Thando radio show. So please don't wait to the last minute. If you're already in the conference line, you can hit star six and one to buzz me and, and add your comment or ask a question. Um, if you're listening on the different platforms that don't have the phone number uh, posted, that conference line number is 530-881-1400, access code 549-032-POUND. And again, just hit star six. Uh, the lady will prompt you to hit number one to be added to the caller's queue, and we will get your call in. Uh, we will be right back on the other side with our guest, uh, President of the Charlotte NAACP chapter, President Corinne Mack. <laughs> This is Brother Elliot, host of Time for an Awakening, and you're listening to Black Talk Radio Network, new media for the new millennium. And welcome back. Um, President um, Mack, um, Jonathan Farrell, I believe that shooting was, was it over a year ago, two years? Are we going close to two years that two this years. has been dragging on? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when um, I have to say that I was pleased with the CMPD uh, response to that shooting. It didn't drag out for months. It didn't drag out for a year. Their investigation and this guy was charged. This officer, Randall Carrick, was charged within 48 hours. Um, the prosecutor took it to a partial grand jury, was unable to obtain an indictment, but he then, as under North Carolina law, as allowed to, took it to a full grand jury panel and was able to obtain an indictment. So now I think they have recently either announced uh, picking a jury or, you know, that has been done, but the guy's supposed to be going on trial, I, I hope, sometime this year. But, I mean, what are your thoughts on that particular case? And is there a problem um, in Charlotte, North Carolina, with racial profiling and police brutality? Well, I, I know that the case is about to um, go to court in May. And I think there's a problem in this country. So clearly, Charlotte's part of this country. I think there is a problem. But I have to commend uh, our chief of police, Rodney, um, because he has done a yeoman's job with staying on top of things, um, talking to community leaders to make sure that that, that at least we have a, a voice. Uh, my, Rodney Monroe has been a blessing to the community because he does listen. And I'm sure the other cities don't have that. And as you said, um, after the Jonathan Farrell shooting, there was action taken quickly. And that came because there was so much um, dialogue between he and, you know, Reverend Kojo, as well as other community leaders, to make sure that everybody understood the real issues here. 
and one of which clearly is that folk who are bigots or racist or have any kind of um, negative thinking or thought process around people of color are going to take actions in a way which you're not aware of until they have an opportunity to do that. And when a person has some authority, sometimes they abuse that authority. The other thing is that there has to be a more um, in-depth training around racism, not only in the police department, but for every city worker, firefighters, sanitation, and what have you, so that people understand, you know, it's not just about diversity training, but take a real look at yourself in the mirror. Do a self-examination. And if when a black person walks down the block in your mind, you say, let me hold my, my pocket to make sure nobody takes anything, then you definitely need self-examination because you have a uh, you have a deep-rooted feeling that, a certain group of people, which is my people, are automatically going to either rob you or steal from you or do something negatively. Um, and that's the kind of conversation we've been having. In addition to that, I think that because we are in the South, and the South is known for um, racism and KKK and all those different things, we can't turn our heads and act as if it's not real. It is real. And in fact, it's been proven that uh, the KKK member, membership drives are on the rise. Mm-hmm. So are we to believe that none of them work as police officers and none of them work as firefighters and none of them work as sanitation workers and none of them work in whatever job you want, description you want to give? They are in different positions throughout this city. How do we handle that? One of the things uh, that I've heard people propose, and I think it's a good idea in, in talking to, you know, uh, people who are knowledgeable on, on these issues is that they think that these police officers should actually undergo psychological testing. Not only, not only police officers, but prison guards as well to make sure that we're not hiring sociopaths. Who, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, I want to go a step further. Sure. I think there should be random checks in, in what their their um, extracurricular activities are. <laughs> what are you doing when you're not at work? Because guess what? If you're at a, a KKK rally with a hood, then you should not be representing us anywhere in the city. You know what that reminds me of, though, uh, uh, President Mack, is um, I'm, I'm in Gaston County right next to Lincoln County. I got family members in, in Lincoln County, and you may have heard uh, because the Lincoln County NAACP you know, made an issue of it of uh, where the FOP Fraternal Order of Police in Lincoln County had a blackface comedian come in, a white man who performs in blackface, uh, come in to do a fundraiser uh, for their police union. And then in my research of this man, he performs at different functions across the nation for not only the police, but fire departments as well. And I thought that was just totally inappropriate. It is. It is inappropriate. Absolutely is. And the mere fact that he didn't know that it was or understand that it is, it's a problem. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, now, another thing, speaking of, of, of police um, chief Rodney Monroe, again, you know, I thought his handling of the uh, Rodney Farrell uh, shooting um, and in the quick action that was taken, and I understand from you that, you know, the community played a role in that, community leaders in dialoguing with him and whatnot. But then I saw another case after that where this uh, black male was handcuffed and was in a police interview room, and he and the arresting officer had some words, and this man is handcuffed. And he shoves him into, you know, the concrete wall, breaking his collarbone. And I, again, quick action. And that officer was charged with a assault. So I have to say, you know, I have been impressed thus far, you know, with the quick action of the uh, CMPD investigators in dealing with this kind of uh, issue under the leadership of, of Chief uh, Rodney Monroe. Yes. I really do commend him. I have a lot of respect for him. Now, I wanted to um, change gears to my county. Unfortunately, I'm going to um, look to see if I can contact him again. I'm not sure of what's going on here in Gaston County in terms of the NAACP. We had a shooting in Dallas uh, 
about maybe th- four years ago, and we didn't even know there was a chapter in Gaston County for the NAACP. And, you know, I tried to invite him on the program. I think he did agree to the program, but he wasn't being, he was kind of being cryptic. But, you know, it's not that we have a whole lot of these kind of shootings and stuff happening in this area that I have seen, but I'm very concerned about this recent shooting there in Gastonia. A 74-year-old James Allen, a U.S. Army veteran, a Korean War veteran, um, had just had heart surgery. Um, his family uh, lives out of town and they couldn't get in contact with him by phone. So they called the police and asked them to do a wellness check. Well, the police go, they knock on the door one night. Nobody comes to the door. So they leave and, and then they check the hospitals and, and whatnot. I thought all of that was great. Okay. We concerned. We don't check the hospitals. Nobody's heard from him, but then. They come back the next day and with the assistance of the Gastonia Fire Department break into uh, Mr. Allen's home. And like his brother said, you know, I would assume somebody's breaking in my house to rob me. And, you know, uh, Mr. Allen being a, a, a firearm owner, legally owned firearm, had his weapon in his hand, you know, to defend himself against these intruders. And, you know, the rest, all we know is, is that this cop, shot and killed uh, Mr. Allen, and the SBI is investigating. Um, I have many questions. I know you can't answer them, um, but I'm, I'm doing my research. I'm reaching out to, you know, my contacts around here because I have many questions like, well, how, how long of an opportunity was he given, you know, to respond? And, you know, I heard this local attorney say that, you know, it was absolutely legal for them to go in his house like that doing a wellness check. Well, I'm thinking, you know, that, you know, you broke into his home. You broke into his home. I could see if you saw signs that possibly a foul play, like, you know, somebody had already broke in there. Let me go up in here and make sure nobody's hurt or whatnot. But you didn't see any of those signs and you break into this man's home. And just like John Crawford, even though John Crawford in Ohio wasn't breaking any laws, had had a BB gun. And even though that's an open carry state, how quickly they gunned him down, how quickly they gunned down that child, Tamir Rice in Ohio, within mm-hmm. seconds of contact. And I'm afraid that is what has happened here. Again, all I can do is speculate until more information is known. But I, I assume you have heard about this case. And if so, what are your thoughts? I have. I've heard about the case. And what I can say to you is that um, I did reach out to the um, chapter president. Um, because that's protocol. You know, I don't like to step over um, my boundaries. Okay. Um, and I understand that there is an investigation on our side happening now. So he is doing something. Great. I think that that you get quiet right now because they're waiting to get the response back from the legal minds who are involved with the case. I just would ask you to, to be a little patient and reach out to him again, and he will give you all the facts. But I, what I can talk about is that based on that case, the kind of conversation I want to have with the police department around the dispatchers, the dispatchers' policy um, and training and how we need to do something to tighten that up because we don't know, um, I don't know exactly what was said, but it's important to find out exactly what the person says when they call the dispatcher and then what that dispatcher conveys to the police and fire fighters. We need to make sure that everybody involved is in constant communication. We need to make sure that the policies and procedures around entering someone's home changes because you're going into someone's home as a rescue mission, right? I would think in that instance. But that and person so doesn't know is that. Is there a need to have a, a gun pulled when you're going into someone's home mm-hmm. in a rescue mission? Right. And so this is why I said procedurally there was some breakdown somewhere in my mind's eye. Um, but like you, I don't have all the facts. But I do know that that, that means that there's an opportunity for some further conversation about procedures, policies, and ensuring that folk are getting, you know, in-depth training to make sure we don't lose another life. 
Right. And, and, you know, I, I mean, because I own firearms, you know, that's been a tradition in my, my uncles. We are hunters and we've had to, my uncles and my grandfather had to protect themselves against the clan. Um, here when they burn a cross in my grandfather's yard, um, mm-hmm. North Carolina had, you know, the largest, uh, clan membership through in the United States, according to the uh, documentary film Clansville, USA. Uh, right. Robert Williams is from here. Robert F. Williams, Negroes with Guns, who was a former NAACP chapter president in Monroe, who then later formed the Black Guard. And so we in this area, I, I know you said you're from New York, but but we black people here in North Carolina have, especially in this area, Around Mecklenburg, Gaston County, Lincoln County, we have a tradition of owning firearms for self-defense. And so my thing is, is that this could happen to any of us. You know, again, he doesn't know who's breaking into his house. And it's we do know for a fact they broke in because they're acknowledging that they broke in. But like you, well, if, if you're going on a rescue mission, why didn't the fire department go in first? Why is the police? Well, that's why, that's, that's yeah. why I'm asking you to, um, to be patient. To be patient, and then converse with the president again, so that we, we, you know, so that at least you and the NAACP are on the same page in that conversation. And then if we have to go to war about something, then we do it collectively. Right. Because I'm all about, I'm all about us uniting. Yeah. And, I, and I the, know that we don't have any power if mm-hmm. we have small little groups putting out fire. You know what and, I mean? Yes, yes. And let me just make, make, um, I think there's some misunderstanding. I haven't reached out to the local chapter president yet because I wasn't okay. even sure if there was still a chapter. And, okay. um, and, and I don't even know if it's the same president from years ago, you know, when, no, uh, they, it's a new president. Okay. New it's president. a new president. Oh, do they have a website? I'm not sure. I'm uh, not sure if he does, but what I can do is when I get home tonight, because I'm getting ready to go to a CMS meeting, about the school system tonight okay. and, and see what's going on with the school system tonight. When I get home tonight, I will send an email to you with his phone number okay. so you can reach out to him. All right. That that will be great because, you know, I had been telling people on the air here, you know, I don't live in Charlotte and we have, you know, uh, made sure we kept up with, with uh, Jonathan Farrell's case and whatnot mm-hmm. that I felt fortunate to live in a county where I'm not hearing about you know, cause we track police violence on a daily basis. I mean, it's up mm-hmm. to, it's up to a thousand people. We include everybody, whites, black, Hispanics. It's mm-hmm. over a thousand people a year being killed by cops. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and, and all of those cannot be justified. All right. Many of these people are unarmed and, and whatnot or in situations where they have legally owned firearms and they're not breaking the law. And, and mm-hmm. so I felt fortunate to live in a county where I'm not hearing about all of these these type of stories of, of what may be unnecessary force or excessive force. And then here comes this story. And I'm like, wow. You know, cause I'm a veteran too. And then I'm wondering, okay, is the VFW going to step up with this investigate? This man was a veteran. Y'all say y'all, you know, down for the veterans and all this and that. Where are you? And, and making sure this is above board and, and, and whatnot. So I will be patient. Okay. But I get passionate cause I'm tired of seeing the killing of, of President Mack. I, I do. I do. I too. Um, <laughs> sometimes my passion is scared folks, but you know, the thing about it is we need to make sure that at the end of the day that the family is covered by us, mm-hmm. that justice is served, um, and that we as a people, when I say people, I mean black people first, and that the people of North Carolina come together because there is power in numbers, no question about it. And so I would hope that this conversation that we're having now doesn't end when I get off the air, that you and I begin to build a relationship and whomever you may know, come to the table, whoever I may know, come to the table, and we can have a collective group of people who come together on common issues so that we all win. That's what I'm about, and I'm sure that's what you're all about, or you would have asked me to be on this radio station. 
Yes, ma'am. That is, uh, I'm all about unity in, in the collective. Uh, you know, if we're doing the right things and, and fighting the right issues. So I want to thank you again for spending this time with me and our listening audience. And I would like to give you an opportunity to, you know, give the audience some final thoughts on anything that you would like to speak on. Well, my final thought is that I know that for some out there that they believe that we live in a post-racist country, not so. And at any given time, it could be you to stop by police and within seconds have your life snuffed out, which is why it's so important that you do become engaged. I know some of you have done well, you've made some money and you've bought a nice car and you've got a nice family and you think you've arrived. But let me, let me tell you this. All anyone sees when you walk down the street is the fact that you are an African American. Period. They don't care if you are the CEO of a company or you're a janitor of a company. I would hope that you would take the time to join. And I say join the NAACP because we need you. We are a different agency. We are a different organization. We're a different group of leaders who really believe that it's our responsibility to stand on the front line, to be the soldiers who take the first hit when it comes to any issue around discrimination, any issue around humanity. And we are standing in the fourth row of our humanity. And my question to each and every person, what do you plan on doing? Which road are you going to take? The road of selfishness or the road that says, I am part of this community? And what can I do? What gift can I bring to the table that's going to make it best for each and every person? Because it's really not about us. It's about our children and our children's children. I thank you, and God bless you. President Kareem Mack from the Charlotte chapter of the NAACP, thank you again for joining us, and most certainly we will stay in touch. And uh, there's always an open-door policy uh, for um, you and your organization anytime y'all need to get information out through our uh, channels. Thank you again, and you have a great evening. You too. Bye-bye.